Welcome to Corazon Call. I am automotive journalist Steve Schutz. I'm here with, uh, I'm going to introduce Adams first because you got a lot of stuff you're going to talk about today. I automotive... get to go first? Wow. Yeah. I got promoted. <laughs> automotive a serial collector, consultant, and expert, uh, Adams Hudson. You're and, not going uh, to be the uh, trauma surgeon? I thought that went with being first. Yeah, no, I'm not going to give you a demotion today. Okay. Uh, we do have trauma surgeon Stefan Moran. We are the only podcast and YouTube show that has a trauma surgeon who has operated on many, many car crash victims and done research on car crashes. So Stefan, Stefan Moran, hey. Hey, I'm, I'm going to add to that. I'm the graphics dude because I've been here trying to get the pictures ready for this YouTube podcast. So I've been quiet, but I think I've and got you do it. do a fine job. I think I've got it down. So if you're on Spotify or Apple, you're not seeing the pictures, but we'll describe them. Uh, we'll, we'll describe. We'll try to make it as visual as we can for you. I'm going to start. You know, we have been talking uh, for, well, we really focused on this in the summer of 21. And what we noticed was in the summer of 22, we noticed that there were not, there was like no inventory in new car dealers. And, um, if you could get an F-150 truck and, and I look, there's a, my office looks down on a Ford dealership. So I would count the trucks. And in the summer of 2022, you basically didn't have any. And um, now it's loaded. And what happened was when they were in their trough and they could, they had supply chain problems all related to COVID, they would uh, have very few trucks and they would bring in the loaded ones. So they wanted to sell the Platinums and the King Ranches. And it's the same for the um, uh, the Rams and the the GMs and the Chevys. Um, you know, these are, are pickup trucks that used to go for forty to sixty thousand. Now they're going for eighty to hundred for these top level trucks. Well, um, boy, have things changed! And about two months ago, Ford said we're not going to make any more Lightnings because they have Lightnings, the the BEV trucks stacked up, and people are, are not buying them. Well, now it goes to the regular F-150s, and, and this is true for Chevy, GM, and Ram. They have too much inventory. Um, I walked by a Ram dealership not too long ago. Tons, too many trucks to count. Many of them kind of loaded. So, guys, uh, you know, wh what does this mean? Well, I was at the Ford dealership this past week because my Mustang Bullet had a recall on the software. Or if you backed up in certain certain situations, it would just shut down the basically the computer for the car. So I went in. They had a ninety four thousand dollar Lightning sitting on the lot. They had just gotten delivery of a top of the line F two fifty Platinum that day. A new Mustang GT as well, and then they had a bunch of F one fifties on the lot. They had or Broncos on the lot. Did not see any of the Mustang Mach E's. Hmm. And a shit ton of explorers. I see that as well. And we all see that. And I'm not saying that, you know, we, we were alone in our prediction, but I remember, you know, sometime back, it was like, you know, there was this, this, you know, it was a seller's market and there were all these buyers out there waving, waving cash and, uh, uh, their, their platinum and or black American express cards, uh, trying to get a deposit and get their name on a list. I mean, that was like the talk of a lot of cocktail parties. Where are you on the list? And just like anything in, in, in markets, you know, there's elasticity of pricing, elasticity of, of supply and demand. And, you know, th those things change places like a pendulum a lot. And we saw a dramatic, almost a neck snap of having too little inventory and too many buyers to now the exact opposite. Um, I'm not surprised at all, nor am I sad that there wasn't a mach -E in sight. Uh, presumably that means uh -huh. you know, quit making the silly things. <laughs> But it's it's interesting to see right now, and I think a lot of people predicted this was going to happen. And, um, and I don't know. The collector car market's done the same thing, Adam. Yeah, I think it's reversion, reversion to the mean. And I think that yes. you know, uh, just like in in medicine, uh, unfortunately, uh, when COVID hit in 2020, a lot of older people that were destined to die of uh, pneumonia. In 2025, 2026, maybe 2030, they died in 2020 because COVID was so nasty. Uh, a lot of people that were going to buy a pickup truck in 2025 or 2026 bought one in 2021 or 2022 because of YOLO. 
And then, of course, those buyers are no longer in the market, whereas they may they they would have been if there hadn't been this YOLO effect and the pandemic. But you have higher interest rates. You see, you have more expensive trucks, higher interest rates. The affordability question is huge, and a lot of people bought a truck earlier, and and now they don't want one. And you know, if I can if I can pile on there, you know, and Steph, you're right. It is. It's it's automotive industry wide, and I think we've seen that probably in in RVs and, and, and other, you know, uh, campers and, you know, bigger ticket items that people said, Oh, I got to get that, you know, the YOLO deal. And plus I have a, a stimulus check. I may as well go, go ahead and spend it. I feel like, and I, I sound like I'm a doomsday sort of, uh, profit. I don't mean to be, I feel like I'm barely positive, but just looking at the reality and the statistics out there, there's going to be a glut of people horribly upside down, meaning they owe considerably more on the vehicle than it's worth. And I think that's in the in the coming wave. It may not be like the 2008. I mean, it may not be as big as the 2008 housing crisis that then was the domino that, that led to lots of financial outfall. But I feel like it's coming. I think there's a huge upside down credit, credit market uh, about to retreat heavily and cause rampant bankruptcies. I think it's totally right. This There's week. my good news of the day. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, worst case, you go bankrupt uh, because you have these car notes. You know, a lot of people, it's it's double income uh, families, and they have two car notes. And you have two people uh, with these car notes, they may go bankrupt. That's the worst case. The best case scenario is they can't get out from under their car. So they keep it for 10, 15 years because they can't get out from under it. So. Yeah, we'll follow this, but yeah, things are things are definitely changing. It's becoming a seller's or a buyer's market, and I think it's going to become more of a buyer's market with time. So, all right, trauma surgeon safety, Stevan, what do you have for us today? Well, we're going to do a little follow up today. Um, you know, last week I talked about the very unfortunate um, death of Angela Chow, but I think it gives us an opportunity to um, talk for, further on the subject. So, if you remember. We didn't listen last week. Angela Chow, um, very a billionaire, um, heiress in a shipping company, um, as a sister-in-law of Mitch McConnell. Is that correct? Yeah. But she uh, had a bunch of her girlfriends at her home in Austin. They have a big compound there, a big ranch, and she got in her Tesla at 1130 at night and uh, lost control, went into the pond and drowned. And last week we talked about drowning in automotive cars. But the police report came out this week and, you know, and we were talking about this, you know, I thought about this last week, you know, 11 girlfriends, they're on private property. Well, hell yeah, they're partying. I didn't want to make any accusations that alcohol may have been involved in Angela Chow's unfortunate death. But unfortunately we do have now the security cameras sh showed her staggering out of the, uh, the um, house going to her car now. Could she have boots on? Could have been gravel? All those things, yes. Um, she backed into the water. What's interesting was the lights remained on underwater for one minute. Hmm. Her friend actually found her. She spoke for eight minutes on the phone with her friend in the water. Her friend was actually standing on the car. They were trying to figure out how to get her out of there. And she said, I'm going to die. I'm going to drown. And unfortunately, she did. The left rear window was open on the vehicle. So she had either left it open or managed to get it open, but she couldn't get out to it. They eventually were able to, um, when they did get in the water, when the EMS arrived, they, they tried to pull her out through the left rear window. They could not reach her. I guess she was in a Model X, pretty large vehicle. Um, they ended up breaking the front window underwater. They didn't say how they did that. They probably used an ax and they were able to extricate her. They did CPR. Unfortunately, she died. Well, autopsy uh, was done. This is a accidental death. So autopsies are typically almost always done by the uh, coroner's office, especially someone like this. Well, her alcohol level came back at 0.233. So that is um, about 3.8 times higher than legal limit, 0.08. And to give you the context, here's what the medical description is for physicians when somebody has an alcohol level of 0.233. Confusion, feeling dazed, disorientation, sensations of pain will change. You may or not notice that you're in pain or if you hurt yourself. Nausea and vomiting are likely to occur. You have abs impaired gag reflex, which could cause you to choke or black out. At these alcohol levels, people begin to black out. Um, so you mm -hmm. may have participated. So she was, 
she was highly intoxicated um, and unfortunate and wasn't able to get out the left rear window. So I, I, that makes me want to bring up the subject of, it's always worth revisiting, but the subject of alcohol and statistics that go along with alcohol-related injuries as well as death and fatalities. So if you look globally, about 7% of uh, deaths are related to alcohol. Now, I would say this is markedly underestimated because blood alcohol levels aren't done in all dead people, only with the coroners. So I say that's marked um, a marked unreporting. What we do know, and as you would highly expect, um, in males, 90% uh, of alcohol-related injuries are male-related. Uh, males have a higher preponderance in this global injury rate. And the age group that you'd expect would be the 15 to 39-year-olds. They occupy 40%. Let's talk a little bit about specifically motor vehicle collisions. This is data from 2021. The uh, fatality database is kind of updated on a cyclic, and they collect the data, so you're not going to get it for a year later. So they do preliminary reports. But alcohol is involved in all 30% of traffic-related fatalities. And what's really sad to me is that 21% of children that die, the, the driver was intoxicated drunk. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, one in five kids that dies because the driver is drunk. That's, that's a, just a terribly sad statistic. Um, if you look at fatalities, 22% um, are male, 16 or um, female. So it's a little overall less, but it's still a greater preponderance of men than women when you look, look at specifically motor vehicle fatalities. Motorcycle crashes, 27% involve alcohol of fatalities. And then the other thing you can imagine, you know, Drunk drivers, we talked about confusion, feeling dazed, disorientation. Well, they also typically don't wear their seatbelt. And 66% of drunk drivers that die are not wearing seatbelts. Now, I looked at pedestrians as pedestrians um, versus drivers. And independently, 41% uh, of pedestrian fatalities involve alcohol, where 25% is the pedestrian, 10% is the driver, and 6% are both. So high preponderance of drunk pedestrians walking out, crossing roads they shouldn't get run over and killed. Um, Pedicyclist, um, and that's people on bicycles um, that you actually have to pedal. That's 18% involve alcohol. And you can imagine that the driver, 16% of that is made up by drivers. So it's really a greater preponderance of drivers that are intoxicated drivers hitting the cyclist. We talked about electric scooters about, I think, two weeks ago. And looking at the country, it varies anywhere, but 33 to 48% of all electric scooter, in, scooter injuries are, are intoxicated. And we were in Birmingham last night. We went to a concert. We ate downtown. And there were people on scooters all over the road going the wrong way, the right way, not paying attention to intersections on the, on the curbs. And they were all clearly bar hopping, restaurant hopping, and um, they were drinking. Now, one of the interesting things, you know, do you, there's, um, across the, the country, blood alcohol level is 0 0.8 is the legal limit for, after which you are driving under an influence. Can be Stefan, that is long. every state has that it, consistent? All states, except for Utah is 0.05. Interesting. Now that's kind I, I can't say this for fact, but I'm almost a hundred percent sure that federal highway dollars are tied to blood yep. alcohol, just like Seatbelt usage, um, seatbelt laws are tied to federal dollars. So that's tied to federal dollars. Um, so, you know, in, in very interesting statistics when we look at this. Now, interestingly, in the state of Mississippi, in the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico and Guam, you're allowed to drive with an open container in the vehicle. Meaning you, have, you can have a can of beer in the car and be driving around as long as you're not intoxicated. Um, those are the only three places where... Uh, four places where that still exists. That sounds so 1920s. I, I can't believe I, that's even allowed. But I did yeah. used to, I do remember as a child seeing people drinking with an open container in Alabama. Oh, yeah. which I think it was legal then and they would, they would have a sack around it. Like you wouldn't know what they were drinking out of a sack anyway. So I know I don't want to confuse you with the numbers. You've already made up your mind, but it's 13,300 fatalities a year. 37 fatalities a day and about every one every 39 minutes that are alcohol related. So, you know, thank goodness we've got Uber now. We've got Lyft. 
we still have a terrible public transportation system in this country. But, you know, do not drink and drive. It's just not worth it. Um, and it's not worth it driving, you know, on your own property from one building to another, as evidenced here by Angela Chow. I feel terrible for the family. It's a sad case. But unfortunately, um, you know, the numbers are what they are. And, you know, you Stefan, know, we uh, it's thanks for that. And, and it's such an important lesson. And, you know, you think when you think of drunk driver, you think of someone going too fast, going through a red light or driving off the road at high speed. Uh, I had one encounter. I was on call in San Antonio and it was about three in the morning. I just gone to the hospital. I was driving home and uh, someone was coming at me on the interstate going the wrong way in my lane and uh, scared the crap out of me. I pulled way over and called 911. Um, that's what you think of. But in this yes. case, she just, she meant to put the car in drive and she put it in reverse. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, you mentioned that drunk driving thing with Steve, and I've talked about this before, but our brain is basically lazy and likes to pull up, use old memories or old situations. It doesn't like to rebuild them. So when you're, I guarantee you, when you're going down the interstate, how, how long do you think it honestly took for your brain to believe there was a car coming at you? Because the first thing your brain's going like huh. this, th this image doesn't exist. I was trying to find that image or that memory of what's supposed to be on the interstate. Then all of a sudden your brain goes like, wait a minute, there's nothing here in my memory bank. What the fuck? There is a car coming at me on the interstate. And it's amazing that it is not an instantaneous um, assessment of the situation because you don't know. practice for that. You don't see that. So you're going to have less time to react. That's why people do get hit because they're going, no, it, it like it'd be like going around the corner and seeing a baby in a car seat in the middle of the road. Your brain would be going. It can't. It's like when I hit the rocks on the interstate and my bullet. There aren't supposed to be boulders on the interstate, and your brain is is like going. This doesn't match anything in my memory bank, and we know that about how our brains work. So, um, yeah, I, I know that situation you had. That then all of a sudden you get that adrenaline surge, you're frightened, and then you're going WTF, man, this is unbelievable. So. Yeah, it took it definitely took time to process. I'm yes. kind of squinting and looking at it like, wait a second, is it, what's going on here? Because it just it's something I'd never encountered before. Yes. Uh but amusingly, I pulled way over to this, you know, onto the shoulder, of course, as far off as I can go. And you can tell the guy who was, I'm sure it was a guy who was, you know, obviously very drunk, was going probably 45 miles an hour and really focusing, I'm sure, on the lines because he stayed in the fast lane going the wrong way. So I'm sure he's like, I'm fine. I'm in this lane. Just stay in the lane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not understanding. He's <laughs> going the wrong way on the interstate. So, um, yeah, it took a while to process. So, he all didn't, right. He, he was just in the wrong lane. Yeah. 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 So he, he, he probably thought it was like a two-lane country road, and I was coming toward him. What's the big deal? Um. All right. So uh, oh, yeah. car What's spotting. It? Car spotting. All right. You had a, you had a great one, Stefan. This one make, made me happy. <laughs> There it is. Here, tell people we're looking at, Steve-O. This is a 2020 uh, Mach 1. This is a Ford Mustang Mach 1. And, Stefan, this is kind of, you know, it's almost the equivalent of a bullet, but with, with a lot of uh, kind of, whereas the bullet is understated, this is not understated. I'll let you take it from there, because this is, it's a very cool car. Yeah, so... Um... You know, Ford typically will follow up runs of limited edition Mustangs and they'll bring back the old ones. And then after the bullet ran out, they brought out the Mach 1. And the Mach 1, from the Ford perspective, was designed to be more of a performance car. So it's had the same motor as the bullet, which is 480 horsepower, 420 um, foot pounds of torque. It had the same white cue ball shifter. The Mach 1 gets the Tremec transmission versus mine, which is a Chinese-made transmission. I drove my friend's GT350. The Tremec is a sweet lock and load transmission. It is it it makes my transmission look very unrefined. Um, mine's nice until you do the Tremec and you drive the Tremec, and the Tremec's what's going in my uh, Cobra that I'm building. Different from the Bullet, the GT350 gets the front and rear subframe subframe from the GT350. So what they've done is Basically, the way to think about the Mach 1 is they pulled out the GT500 rear axle cooling system. 
So you're getting a GT350 with different graphics, and you're getting the Ford GT motor that's got a few parts from the GT350. Because the GT350 has the flat plane crank voodoo engine, which is a very cool engine, which is more of a race style engine. You don't see it commonly um, on street cars. So I, the Mach 1 is like a is basically GT350 with a different motor. Um, it's a step in between. I thought it was a great car. Um, definitely an enthusiast car. Um, I do like the ride of my bullet more than my friend's GT350. My, my bullet is more streetable. I think this would drive a whole lot more like the GT350. But we'll get great, great Mustang, great iteration. They pulled all the right parts out of the bin. And uh, they, they were wise to put the Tremec in there because number one complaint from bullet owners is why didn't we get the Tremec transmission? That's funny. Yeah, I, I drove one of these and, and reviewed it. So I, I was psyched when you spotted it. And this is this is such a wonderful, wonderful car. I enjoyed every second. The engine sounds amazing. Uh, but it, it's not like overpowered, like, oh my gosh, it's too much. It's got 400 or so horsepower. But absolute pleasure to drive, absolute pleasure to shift. Um, I've driven this uh, and GT350, and I've drove I drove your bullet. I think your bullet is pretty darn nice, Stefan. I, I didn't see. I mean, yeah, this is a little bit better, but I wouldn't say dramatically so. Your the, uh, the, the 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 transmission in your bullet, I thought was very nice. Hey, I had a bumper sticker sighting. Here we go. So this uh, is uh, this. So <laughs> listeners, this is a Dodge. Hey, before uh, we short. before you get there, yeah. I, I just let me just. I really am dying to know. Go back to the the the, the, um, the, the Mach one Mach one for a second. Yeah, Adams, I had a question. Adams, how col how collectible is this going to be? And go ahead and ask your question. But how collectible is it going to be? You know, I, I I'll, I'll say say uh, two things for it and one thing against it. I think the two things for it are we are at the 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 closing sunset of what we're going to consider the renaissance of the muscle car era. And this is one of the best examples of how to do it right. Uh, I think Ford had a lot on the ball. They trimmed out that body. They made it way more svelte and contoured. It doesn't look overweight. Uh, unlike, excuse me, a Challenger to me looks like a heavier, chunkier car. This car just looks chiseled and cut. Uh, the other great thing uh, for it is it's a Mustang. And, you know, that 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 just carries a cachet in the collector car world no matter what what era, say for maybe the Mustang too, but that's got its own own list as well. But I think the thing against it is there are so many mutations of special Mustangs. There's a bracket for this and a category for that and another sub subcategory for these other ones. I just love it. I hope it's collectible because I want to see them at uh, collector car auctions and shows in the future. So my question, what is this fantastic color? I love that. I have no idea. Do you know the colors, Steve? It's, it's kind of like a a light blue gray, maybe. Is that a correct description, Adam? Yeah. You're more of the artist than I am. I it, it looks, it in the Porsche world, it would be a darker chalk, but I don't know actually what what, what it is. It's great looking. My re it's been a while since I wrote about it, but my recollection is it came in this color, which almost has a hint of seafoam green too. It's like it's a mix of very light blue gray and a little tiny hint of green so it was it was available in this or black just like the bullets available in highland green or black um yeah. so i think those are the fighter jet available. gray i think is what that is great name yeah. yeah i think it's fighter jet gray I just pull them up yep fighter jet gray i think is what it is i like uh, ironic it doesn't look anything like fighter jet Right, we were both in the Air Force, Stefan. If this well, is not, be, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, you're not going to find a fighter jet in this color. But <sighs> no, okay. <laughs> All right, so go to your bumper sticker because well, I did have a bumper sticker sighting. Here we go. So I was behind this car, and she passed me on the left, and it was a she. And the right side mirror was hanging off the car, <laughs> but Perfect. pulling the right hand line, I got behind, and the bumper sticker says "normalizing hitting the curb," and. <laughs> The license plate has pink sequins all around it, but um, I did not get to see the curb rash on the tires, but I have to imagine there was quite the curb rash on the tires. But that's got to be I a thought... Nissan Altima. <laughs> no, it's actually oh, it's a, Dodge. a Dodge. Okay, a Dodge Dart. I was laughing. I thought that is great. Normalizing hitting the curb. <laughs> Tr truth in advertising right there. You know you know that lady is comfortable in her, in, in, in her disposition about hitting the curb. Yes, exactly. Maybe uh, maybe your husband 
Stuck with sticker on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we talked. Uh, this is something I I saw a few weeks ago, and I want to talk about it. Um, and you know, we have Stefan and I together went to to see something called the Wellborn Muscle Muscle Car Museum in Alabama, and I saw the Ingram Collection, and I want to spend a couple minutes on it. Uh, my son got married in Durham, North Carolina. That's where the Ingram Collection is. It's one of the absolute top collections of Porsches in the world. And it was overwhelming. They have a, uh, a car restoration shop associated with it called Road Scholars. And then the Ingram Collection just has these absolutely amazing cars. And I'll list just a few of them. It's overwhelming. But old cars, they had a Gamun Coupe. They had a 550 Spider. That's the car that uh, James Dean died in. 356A Coupe. They had a 356B GTL Abarth, incredibly rare, incredibly uh, valuable. All these cars are valuable. Mm -hmm. 356 America Roadster, 356 Continental. 906 Carrera 6, that's really a racing car, but it, you could actually drive it on the street, believe it or not. Carrera uh, 2.7 RS, 1973 Classic, Porsche 911. New cars, they had a 959S. Most people know 959s are rare, but most of them are the comfort car. The S, they only made 29. They have one of them. 964 Carrera RS America, 993 Turbo S, 992 GT3 Touring in purple. 991.2 GT3 RS, GT2 RS. Uh, they had a 992 Sport Classic and a 997 Sport Classic. 997 Sport Classic was never sold here. They have one. Of course, they have a 918 in the Carrera GT. And that, Steven, they, this is a rebuilt collection because it burnt to the ground. Well, it didn't burn to the ground. What happened okay. was it was in an old warehouse in downtown Durham, and the building next to it, uh, they were doing um, utility work, and there was a gas leak, and that building blew up. And what it did was it collapsed the roof of the Ingram collection. So a lot of these old cars, the roof caved in on it literally. But, you know, it's funny. If you have a car that's worth $5 million, uh, it doesn't cost $5 million to restore it. You know, these it was it was a relatively cheap car when it was new and the parts are available. So it's actually, you know, pretty easy to restore. That's why, you know, you can take, if you just have the VIN number, like, like you just, all you have is the chassis and it's all rusted. You can build yourself a brand new car, use the VIN and uh, it's not as expensive as what it'll be very valuable when it's done. So they rebuilt it. But yes, Stefan, and I'm glad you brought that up because as a result of that catastrophe, and I think five or six of the oldest cars were heavily damaged, all were restored. Wow. Well, it was not one total loss in the whole roof falling in? No. They Good all, gracious. They, that that is mastery and craftsmanship right there. Yeah. They brought them all back. Look nasty. They brought them all back, and now, of course, the, you can't even tell anything ever happened. But as a result of that, the Ingrams have been at the forefront of a new movement in the collector car area, which is drive the cars. And in fact, they took uh, they were they and friends. There was like a six, I think, six cars, including two five fifty Spiders and all three fifty sixes, and they drove it across the Dolomites to Stuttgart to the museum through rain. It was like a five-day trip or something like that. And this is what the Ingrams have done. They said, hey, drive these cars. Don't let them sit. So they, it sounded like they had a YOLO moment in, in the midst of this catastrophe yeah. to say, why are we just looking at these mantelpiece cars instead of experiencing them? Yeah, and I want to I want to expand on that. Uh, just for the record, Bob Ingram was a, and he, he died last year, a pharma pharmaceutical executive. He ran GlaxoSmithKline for... Uh, many years, and then he retired. And early on in his CEO ship, he started buying old Porsches. And he was very, very discerning, and his taste was amazing. And he built up this collection, which have now the collection has now been taken over uh, and inherited by his two sons, Cam and Rory. Cam also runs the restoration shop. But these cars are will be in the family forever. It's a, it's an amazing collection. All right, Steve, let's, show, let's run through some pictures here for those on YouTube. That's a, a late 60s on the top, 911S, slate gray. There's a 992 GT3 RS in green, green with and the, white. Yeah, why with those lizards? I don't like, I've never liked when they throw little lizard, lizard green accoutrements 
on a car like this has got green rims and green mirrors. The, yeah. the rest of the car is white and carbon fiber. So yeah, just scroll because there's a lot to see here. It's the language of that car. I agree with you, Steph. It, it doesn't fit my aesthetic, but it just sort of like is a thumbprint of what those are. That's a 1950 356 undergoing restoration. There's a 550 Spider. And the old James Dean it. car. Yep. Yeah, and right behind it is the Abarth. The oh yeah, look at that. The Abarth. Wow. It's that is just a, a normal uh, green, um, sort of forest green, 930 turbo behind that. Keep scrolling. Uh, there's your um, America Roadster. There's the Abarth car again. Keep going. Uh, there's the America Roadster. It's so beautiful. Incredible. So that's a good Incredible. look. This, listeners, this, this is an old Porsche, but it's got a split front window. Um, and that I think that split front window is just so cool looking. Um, yeah, I thought the Corvette Stingray with the rear split window is cool, but this front split window takes it away. That's just too cool. And then, uh, before they could bend glass, you know, they just, yeah, had to, the way they did it, it's awesome. There's a continental, Steve. Are we in the same building that fell yeah. in? Or they moved, no, 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 they moved it. This okay. is, uh, they have it in an old, uh, hot dog uh, factory. So they used <laughs> to make hot dogs there, and now it's just an empty building. So they bought it. Uh, the building, the the building that collapsed, uh, is gone, but the floor is still there, and it's got like a checkerboard floor. And I walk by it. There's a Continental Coupe. I walk well, by. Listeners, uh, so he just shows that this gorgeous. What color blue is that, Steve O? That's this know. great blue. Looks like it's Albert, got, Albert Albert Blue. Albert I think. Blue. Yeah. And it's got three pieces of or four pieces of custom luggage in the back. That's very. Oh, cool. it sure does. That's fabulous. Yes, fabulous. Oh, look at that. Gotta be a 356A. There's your two sport classics, 992 and 997, uh, with the Carrera GT in the foreground. And there's your Carrera RS 964, a 993. Uh, I think it's a turbo behind it. Adams, you would know. I'm just sitting here laughing because it's just door handle to door handle to door handle with incredible a, cars. Yeah, Oslo Blue uh, GT2 RS. There's your 959S. Wow. So listen, for you younger listeners, um, you the 959 S, um, take a look at 959. And when this thing came out, it kind of had the same effect on young enthusiasts like the Lamborghini Countach and the Testarossa. It was such a mind blowing design that there were posters of these all over the place. And think about it. What, what year did the 959 come out, Steve-O? It was like 19, yeah, 88, 89. 88. So you imagine this car coming out in 1988. Look at this thing. And it was a spaceship and it had unbelievable technology for the time. Um, but the, what a cool car. It's so like Adams, they, they Adams talk about this. I, I, you know, we have not actually had a direct conversation about this collection and you're a Porsche guy and you're a collector guy. Give us your thoughts. Well, you know, I mean, I, I look at this like a lot of us who are just car guys, collectible or not. You just look at it just in awe and you know there's a huge, you know, on one side people say, oh, it's just such a, a big financial play, but it's passion. Passion is what drives the heartbeat of the collectible mindset. Um, some people uh, extend their finances well beyond what would be rational just to do it because their passion is so high. And you know, Steve, I look at this like you, and I probably would just have been speechless walking up and down the aisles, you know, just listening yeah. to whatever they say. Um, and, and I wanted to ask you, um, what is the evolution of this? I mean, you, you mentioned that that Bob, uh, the, the dad passed. What are the children, the heirs, the, the current um, curator team? What are they? Are, are they going to let it be static? Do they change it? What is the future of this collection? Well, uh, both of them were out of town. They were at a, a big car meet in uh, Miami. Uh, as you as you know, there was this new thing that popped up in Miami to compete with Emilia Island, and they went to Miami. So I was not able to talk to either brother. And they, they um, the gentleman who gave us a tour uh, didn't really talk much about the, um, the collection itself. He just let us see it. I think what they want to do is the older, valuable cars, of course, they'll keep them forever. They call themselves stewards. They don't really call themselves owners either. And, uh, you know, let's face it. These are all cars, probably the whole collection. 
you know, you see cars driving around in the street and you know, in 20 years, the vast majority of cars you see are going to be crushed and dead. These cars in 100, 200 years will still be around. They'll still be valued. So they look at it that way and they pick cars. They're very discerning in what they pick. Uh, it's I found it very interesting, the different colors. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, it seemed like they wanted to have different colors represented, different years represented, and the very best of both. Well, when a collection can change, I think that's really what what sort of makes it more viable for the future. Um, and you know, sh shifting in shifting uh, gears here, Steve. Unless you've got more uh, photos to show, or Steph, you, you want to talk about the Wellborn collection before we dive into collections? Or yeah, I I, I wanted to have uh, Adams okay. talk about you know the different types of collections and give us his perspective. But the Wellborn collection, I think, is the muscle car equivalent of mm -hmm. the Ingram collection. It's the very, very best, and then very well maintained. They have enough money to keep these cars the way they need to be kept. They keep them secure. They keep them safe. And the Wellborn collection, it's Devon, you can tell, talk about it for a second, but very much like the Ingram collection, it's it's the best. It's the top. Yeah. So Tim Wellborn is down in Alex City, Alabama, and he has the world's largest collection of 19, uh, 1969 and 1971 Dodge Chargers. And it all started, his dad bought a 71 Hemi Charger and dad passed off the, um, the business to the wife, passed on the Hemi Charger to the wife. Tim thought he was going to get that car. And then mama eventually gave, when she passed away in the will, Tim got the business and he got the 71 Hemi Charger. And He's always been incredibly fascinated with the Hemi Chargers and has built his collection around his passion for that car, which started with riding in his mother's Hemi Charger. Uh, so he, he's been collecting them. He's world famous for his collection of cars. It's worth the trip by a lot of memorabilia in there. He is a super nice guy. When we were there, he, he knew he knew we were coming because we made a private a private appointment to view the collection. And he actually had just finished bush hogging and wanted to sit down and drink a couple beers with us. But unfortunately, we had to hit the road, so he didn't. But um, fantastic. He does have a few other cars, like he's got this GTO. But he's got, I'm showing you a picture of this great Dodge that has every paint sample that they you could get to Dodge in, all painted in stripes on this one car. <laughs> Barracuda. Um, I'm sorry, Barracuda. <laughs> yeah, I just called it Dodge or the Plymouth. Okay, you know I'm a Ford guy. I'll <laughs> let you describe the cars. But here it. So here's a picture of me, listeners. He of did have a Ford. seventy. The only Ford in the collection, a seventy Boss four twenty nine. Of course, that's what I wanted my picture in front of. Um, and then we'll finish with this one here. I think this is that's the one. That's, that's the seventy one yeah. Emmy uh, Dodge Charger that his mom had, and it looks like a. Looks like a mom's car. It has, it's like a moss, dark moss green, and it's got a vinyl top, and uh, it's it is an automatic, so it's like a mom car. But oh, by the way, it has a Hemi. <laughs> and every single option except for air conditioning, which I which I couldn't understand being in the South. No, no. no. They they went for hood pins, but no air conditioning in yes. Alabama. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So. So, Adams, I did want to pick your brain on this because these are two great collections, but not every collection is great. Some are lousy. Some are good. There's all kinds. They're all over the map. And I wanted to, given your uh, experience, kind of pick your brain on that. Well, I'm I'm glad to do it. You know, and it's fun to look at these. You know, sometimes you don't think about the mindset of the collector. So, or, or like, what what does it? And as we referenced earlier, a lot of people say, oh, it's just a lot of money. And that's 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 not even close to what it is. I mean, Wellborn started riding in the back seat of his mom and dad's charger with no air. And, you know, that that's where his started. And by the way, Steph, as I remember, there may have been one more Ford there, and that was the Carroll Shelby transporter truck. Was it there when you were there? I did not see it. No. He he had that I mean, when I was there. You would have you would have noticed the bond. I would I would have been I'd have gone crazy. Yes. <laughs> he, he'd, you'd have probably snuck in there and been a stowaway. It was pretty cool looking. But you know, there's uh there, as I, I looked into this a little bit more, there's there's three basic types and we will we'll discuss the three types a little bit individually but the three big types and people think about it are hoarders would be the first group and these are people who are like really consumptive collectors and they're in one sense collectors but they're really almost protectionists in a way they 
sometimes grew up in a sense of lack and and you know you'll see it in 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 crazy ways that it manifests itself where people get um uh just basic supplies they're afraid they're going to run out of soap or toilet paper or something like that and they just collect it just just almost mindlessly and we we think about maybe in terms of like uh if if you want to show a couple graphics up from from here stuff there's a the cat lady. We think about the cat lady in the neighborhood. Well, she started off as a cat fan, and then it just sort of caught on, and then it's some sort of like almost psychosis that there's, you know, if two is okay, then five is okay, then 30 is okay. And then you see people like the next graphic down, people who, as a sense of self-expression, want one mm. or two tattoos. And then, although this lady is quite beautiful in her own right, uh, she goes so far in self-expression that there's no more selfless left it is mere, merely expression and we see in the hoarder mentality or the consumptive um, type mentality this particular man uh harold lemay of uh, tacoma washington amassed at its peak it's not as big now but at its peak and he has since passed away three thousand cars he grew up in the depression uh they walked a lot of places they had a horse uh, when people had cars, he felt a sense of lack and he wanted a car. And so when he made his money in automobiles, by the way, uh, he started buying cars and he would buy anything that rolled and ran. And so it was 3000 and it was like, like almost too much. Well, now, like you mentioned, the Ingram collection, this collection is being managed. It is being chosen. Certain ones are sold off. They, they, they conduct tours. These have gone from kind of sitting outside junkers that nobody knew what they were. Not all of them, but some of them were just neglected and they've been brought up to a standard. So now this is a real life collection and this is a subset within the hoarder or a consumptive collector. Here's where it splits. Here's if you look at the next graphic, here's a similar shot of a not well managed collection. And this was one Stefan and I know personally. Um. Royce Kershaw estate, which was recently auctioned in the last month that was auctioned off. And this was a collection that was largely inherited by the son 50 years previous by his collector father. And these cars have mostly sat just like this. They've collected dust and rust and neglect. Most of them do not run. And I'm not trying to be negative on that. I'm just saying like, this is a mindset uh, that there was some some concern of changing what had been and and maybe a reverence of the old and didn't want to disturb. And so these cars, after the son's passing, were sold by the widow. And that's what a lot of us think of. It's like we see these collector car shows. We see them on YouTube or television where there's some widow. Usually it's like the males are typically doing the car collecting. And she doesn't know what to do with this stuff. And she doesn't know where it is or what it what it is or why the man had it. It was just his obsession. And then there's a uh, the the second group uh, would be the um, not the hoarder type, but somebody who's theme based. And this is very much like the Ingram collection or the Wellborn collection, where if it's theme based, there's real thought behind it. And this is what they intend to do is to have a unifying theme. This is our friend Gary Duncan of Duncan Imports. And he just, he he's a guy from a, a sort of, he would call it the boonies of Virginia, but it's 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 not not in a big town in Virginia and uh, Christianburg. And he went to Japan for the first time and was just in awe of what are called K cars, K-E-I cars, uh, little, little micro, very diminutive little Japanese cars. And he just, something turned on in him and he had been a GM dealer, mostly Buick and Chevrolet. And he just fell in love with them. Well, he has 1,200 <laughs> JDM cars. And so you might say that he's a little obsessive about the <laughs> art particular. Yeah. Thank <laughs> yes. Whereas, uh, to be fair though, he does sell them. It's a business. Yes. He does. Yes. He actually also fully understands that there is a there is a, a, a learning and a churning and a and a uh, earning that goes with it. And he adds to his collection. There are certain ones he will not sell or says he won't. Maybe that's just to drive up the price because he's so shrewd and very smart. And an, a, another uh, 
theme w- would be the next one, and this is like taking it to a real extreme. Sotheby's is currently auctioning the very end of what they call the white collection. And the white collection, as you might imagine, only white cars and only Porsche. Now, that is a micro, micro fine tip on this thematic type collector. And there's 56 of them that got auctioned. And we do not know who it is. It was anonymous. So whatever quirks might be in the personality to only do white Porsche, the quirks uh, persist. That person does not want to be known, maybe very humble or just very, very secretive. And then the third type would be the investor. And the investor collector, and and by the way, you can be combinations, but the investor collector, he's uh, forecasting a future return. They speculate. Uh, It's often coupled with some of these other type collections in mind, and they may not think of themselves purely as an investor, but this particular person collected nothing but Dodge Vipers. And this was his thing. And I'm going to quote from exactly how he bought them. Now, he got some heck for this. Now, this man is a very good investor, or he wouldn't have been able to get these cars, but his uh, gentleman's name is Bill Blewett. Now, he is a Viper fan. He didn't do it just to, to try to maximize return, but he says, and I quote, I first noticed them because I thought that Vipers were drastically underappreciated and undervalued. So I started researching. I developed a plan of what I thought my investment return could be in a 5, 10, and 15-year period. He was about 55 or so years old when he dreamt up this, this particular plan, And he figured when he was 80, his children could divide the spoils. And that's kind of the way three types of mindsets work out in the collector world. And there are now, if you can't afford 40 Vipers or a 300 SL Gullwing or a Ferrari GTO, now if you go into that next graphic, there are people who will do fractional investing for you. They will buy a portfolio, or they have purchased a portfolio of automobiles the same way people do it, do in collectible coins, collectible art, or even real estate, where you become a fractional owner and you get a return divvied up over whatever your portion of that fraction is. And I actually did not look into see who is outperforming who, but it is known that automobiles have outperformed um, fine art, stamps, and coins uh, over seven of the last 10 years. Now, I do not know if 2024 is probably going to pan out to be a little bit differently, but that was sort of the pitch there. So there's your three types. There was a there was a um, fractional ownership thing uh, back in the very late 80s, early 90s. And some, some you know, it's like basically a hedge fund or not a hedge fund, but a private equity fund. And then they invested in in blue chip cars. And I remember that, kind of blew up as everything, you know, went into the recession, the cars lost value. I, I think it's interesting that you say that they beat uh, art, fine art, and real estate. I'm not surprised because um, cars have done really well. But uh, I don't think you can ever long-term beat the, the S&P 500. You know, and I, th- I think you're right. And I think one of the things they leave out of that, of course, they're trying to sell this fractional investment. And, you know, there is that passion involved, which is where we started this. You know, like I own stock, all of us own stock. I kind of don't give a rip a little bit. I mean, I don't get emotionally involved in the pro- Sometimes I do. Sometimes it's like, oh, it's about the product or the service. But it's just a return. And it's a very cold and very sterile way to look at where your money's parked. But in automobiles, the things that they don't tell you about is they leak oil. They wear out. They need insurance. They need maintenance. Now, I I don't have any collectible art, but I- Sounds like a teenage kid. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. A lot of maintenance and unpredictable maintenance. Yes. But you know, I don't have any collectible art, but I guarantee you you, you don't need to jumpstart them and they don't drip on your furniture. And uh, automobiles come with an inherent risk of atrophy is almost as expensive as use. Yeah, Stefan, uh, we've talked earlier on the show about the McLaren F1, and this applies to many supercars. People don't understand. It certainly applies to Bugattis. People don't understand. Parts time out. Uh, It's not like, you know, miles or anything like that. Like in a McLaren F1, you have to get a new gas tank every five years. You have to get all kinds of different things. The tires, the tires cost 
uh, thousands of dollars. You have to get new ones every five or so years. Lots and they're of not parts, a boys. A lot of parts. No, lots of these parts time out, and you need to change them. So there's a constant, constant uh, amount of money you have to feed into these cars, even if they sit there quietly, atrophying, as you said. And that's not even talking about insurance. Indeed. Indeed. Well, one thing I was wondering about- Where Jay Leno, Adams? What's that? He, where did you classify Jay Leno's collection? I mean, I think everybody, our listeners have heard, you know seen Jay Leno, seen his cars. He does. He, he is not open to view his cars, I'm, I'm sure, by invitation. Um, but he has he has an enormous collection of very well restored drivable cars. But it's you can't you can't corner him into what what kind of collector he's other than he just buys what he likes or sees or wants. Well, you just named his category. Actually, one of the themes is what you like. Yeah, and his seems like out there, but you know, I mean, he sort of famously or infamously does not own a Ferrari because he does not like the political game that the Italians play with Ferrari ownership. But the guy owns steam cars and crazy knucklehead motorcycles, and and I think his his collection is somewhere in the three hundred car range. And, you know, the, the great thing about him is he shares, you know, he shares via, via, via uh, uh, cameras allowed in his place. And I feel like he's very, very open about him, unlike the, the white collection guy who probably those cars hadn't seen the light of day or anybody else even touching them for years. But um, he would be hard to classify other than how you said it, which is that's what he likes. Yeah, I would say yeah. his his thing is innovation. So his theme is innovation. And uh, the steam engine at the time was very innovative. And then he's got like the Chrysler turbine car. He's got one of those because it's innovative. Something that was very exciting for its time, he has. And, uh, you know, yeah, I think point. that's that's. Kind I, of I think thing. that's a great way to say yeah. it. Yeah, because he's got a Dishabo, a Citroen Dishabo, a Citroen DS and a Citroen SM because they were incredibly innovative for their times. And yeah. Which I thought was so cool. I'd never think that he'd have one of those cars. You know, I think the thing that surprised us not to dwell on Jay Leno, but I mean, to, you know, go ahead and bring him up to the top here because we're talking about collectors and he is one of the most notable and relatable collectors of, of the modern era is that I think people were surprised at how willing he is to get his hands dirty. The guy has got an engineer's brain. He understands mechanics like anybody who's paid to be a mechanic or a technician. And I think that's pretty fascinating for a person who lets, you know, broadly generalize that the Hollywood dude with a ton of money who goes out and buys a car barely knows where to put the key. Yeah, Jay, Jay Leno got, famously oh also caught far and got burned working on one of his cars. You know? He did. That's right. He got he had facial burned, healed up fine, but yeah. Now he, yeah. he from a, is from a steam car. Yeah, he rolls his sleeves up and he is in it, which I love. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, one of the best collections I have ever read about in my life was something called the Hara collection, the Bill Hara collection. Oh, yeah. And Bill Hara died in that collection was sold off. He, 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 who knows what happened to it, but it was absolutely sold off. Jay Leno is in his seventies. He does not have children. I don't know. I wonder what's going to happen to his collection. Hopefully they'll turn that place. Hopefully I, I should hope that he would have some form of an endowment for, in perpetuity to make that place a museum that we could go see the cars. And, and almost like a national museum. I mean, honestly, that that car could be a worldwide national automotive museum for the, the collection that he has. You know what I'm sensing here is a cars on call road trip. Or well, road I was in Huntsville. <laughs> Al, I was in Huntsville. Huntsville Hospital like ten years ago did a fundraiser, and Jay Leno was. They always have either a comedian or a band, and it was Jay Leno's year. And at the silent auction. They auctioned off private tours with Jay Leno of his um, collection, and, and I got out. I got outbid. I yeah. got outbid, uh, but that well, would be wonderful. We're but hey, we're we're influencers now. We're cars on call. Surely we can get an invite. I mean, all uh, our advertisers that we have paying sponsorship, we're there. Just send I, I, I would. I would bet we could get a a, a tour. So we'll we'll think about that before we sign off. We we're a little short of time, but. What kind of collectors are we? And, uh, you know, Adams, what kind of collector are you? Are you a hoarder or, I mean, you're not almost not a collector because you sell your cars so quickly. But what, let's say you, you know, a question for all of us, you get $20 million, 
and you you have to buy five cards. You have to see what the five cards are, but what would be the theme? You know, uh, start with uh, you. well, and, and when you brought this question up, I actually did start thinking about it. Did, did I have a purpose in that? And mine was always small. I didn't really have a real collection, maybe eight cards at the most, you know, would have been the top. But mine, I have to, I'll just go ahead and say, uh, mine was more revolving collection because partly I sort of had to justify having it. I couldn't just have cars nibbling at me and eating at me financially all the time. I wouldn't have been able to win that argument at home for very long if it had been an incredibly costly thing. So I tried to buy with the mind toward what I thought would be a financial return, whether or not it paid off in time or what I like to do is improve a vehicle. I mean, I almost get excited when a car needs buffing or needs the the under tray uh, 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 under motor compartments dry iced. But what kind I, of cars? You have five cars. Would it be you know cars from the sixties, seventies? It would modern? all be post war European performance cars. That would be sort of a broadish category. Uh, the the oldest I ever really liked was a sixty seven. Uh, I think that was a pinnacle performance year of the 60s, and probably the newest would have been the 05 Ford GT. And I would be somewhere in that gamut. I wish I could put a finer point on it, but it just performance European cars, other than the occasional American car, would sneak in. One I, I would have, and I'll, we'll end with Stefan, I would have a Ferrari Lusso from the early 60s because it's the most beautiful car, in my opinion, ever made. I would, I, um, yeah. I'd, have, I'd have one of those. Uh, I would keep my uh, E92 BMW M3 because it's it's my car, but V8, uh, the only M3 uh, V8 manual transmission, I keep that. I would definitely get, obviously, a Porsche. I think I'd get the 2016 911R because I like that it's water-cooled uh, and probably the best water-cooled uh, manual transmission streetcar. I'd get a 993 Turbo. Um, arena red, even though it's a cliche, I don't care. I love, love, love that car. It kills bugs fast. And I'd have a lot, I'd have a Lexus LFA. And I just came off those with the top of my head. I don't I believe don't, you. I think he researched this question for a week. That is a fabulous list. That's my list. That's and, a great uh, list. But I, but you see what I'm saying? It's mixed. And I, my sense yep. is Stefan would have more of a, of like Ford type stuff, but Ford, uh, Stefan? You know, so my collection is, would is would be that you know like when i saw my wife for the first time there's that i just knew it it just had that feeling there's that emotional attachment and my collection would be cars that give me that same appeal to me deeply at some emotional level it may be visual it may be memory so i'd have a citroen dishavo a citroen ds a citroen sm wow. i would have a shelby gt350 uh in white with with blue stripes I would have the Cobra that I'm, I'd have an original CSX narrow hip Cobra, which is what I'm building my personal Cobra. And then um, I would have to have a 62 Ferrari GTO. That is just to me, mm. that, that is the, I'm I think key, he maxed his coupe. budget. <laughs> well, one car blew the budget. So yeah, I'd have, I'd have you to only have 20 million car. <laughs> and then, um, and I would have to have I would have to have a newer Bentley in there. Um, I'd have a new Bentley. I just, I'm emotional. Bentley's just appeal to me. And I think it goes back to the time when my grandmother took me to a museum um, in France and we stopped to eat because there were all these cars going back to England. I was probably 13 at the time that were going back to England that had been to the, to the historic Le Mans. And it was the Bentley boys were there with their, their blower Bentleys that they'd driven over from England. And to see one of those and to meet those old guys, I cannot find the picture. But so for me, my car choices are ones that when I see them, they evoke a tremendous emotional response, either visually or bringing up incredibly fond memories from my past. And that's that's what my collection would be. Well, you um, guys have done such a fabulous job. I hate to have been such the generalist and then I'm simply <laughs> here in the collector hot seat. So I'm going to jump on out there. If I've got a minute left and I'm going to say a, um, a uh, 65 Aston Martin DB5 from the 60s. Not a DB4. You like the DB5 more. I like the DB5. Okay. James Bond. Mildly yep. more refined, if that's even uh, the case. I go the DB4, but I, I agree. Then. Okay. I like it. And then a 71 or two, wouldn't matter to me, a Ferrari Daytona and some sort of blue with tan. 
Uh, I just, I just think that's just like knew that was coming. Yeah, (laughs) the pinnacle pinnacle car, and it would have to be. We had to have something to wear those Gucci loafers with. (laughs) (laughs) They're narrow enough to fit into that wheel well. You gotta have them, and you can't wear socks. So you need to. (laughs) That's right. Every three trips, Um, and the BMW Z8. Mm. That from New York, yeah, yeah, that's nice coming too. Yeah, just, 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 just Great gotta pick. have it. And and a Carrera GT, and then I'm through. I love it. I love it. You get the Alpine and Z8, right? Uh, <laughs> I'll give you the wheels and the automatic. If I don't have to. <laughs> All right, that'll be the final word. Uh, to close this out. All right, thank you if you're watching on YouTube or listening in on Spotify or Apple. Remember, like, listen, subscribe, hit the bell, and leave comments, send ideas, and we'll see you guys next week.